Uh, Karen has been the, the current president of the California Association of Wine Grape Growers since 1996. She's been a very influential person in, in, in state politics concerning the, the wine grape industry. Um, she also serves on the, the board of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Uh, she also has a, a farm in Nebraska, I understand. 800 acres in the western part of the state. At this point, I'll let though, Karen come up and talk and watch out where you're standing. Oh, standing right? <laughs> it's very nice to be here, and I want to thank Sandy for the invitation. Um, I also want to congratulate you because when I first read the invitation, I thought there was a mistake. 96th annual meeting. That is so awesome, and I just congratulate you for the successes that you celebrated over 96 years. The California Association of Wine Grape Growers is only 35 years old. We're just an infant at your knees, and we still continue to learn a lot from Napa. Um, we were created 35 years ago because we were, believe it or not, wine grapes are one of the last major commodities that didn't have an organization to work specifically on those types of commodity issues. But I also want to say that we pride ourselves on working very closely with the regional associations, with the state farm bureau, and with the county farm bureaus. And now more than ever, that's so important. You have been blessed with such great leaders in the state legislature and now in Congress because you have such great re working relationships with local government. And as we look at term limits, which in my opinion is part of our problem with the budget right now, people turning over so fast they never gain that knowledge and, that, and develop the collegial relationships to solve problems, our, our new incumbents coming into Sacramento are from local government. So what you do to work closely with local government, whether it's city councils or boards of supervisors, is really critical for all of agriculture as we work on issues in Sacramento. So I just want you to know how very much I appreciate what you do every year and what you have done for 96 years. Um, Sandy asked me to talk a little bit about maybe some issues that we're working on that may or may not be specific to wine grapes. But since I got here tonight, I was asked a couple of things. I, I heard that Secretary Koromora spoke to you last year about ag vision and this whole notion of trying to think about agriculture in the year 2030 and what would it take to get there. That was a process that was started more than a year and a half ago by the State Board of Food and Agriculture. Last summer we held seven hearings around the state. We gathered testimony from 350 witnesses and lots more written testimony. It was open and available on the website for people to weigh in on. It was a very important process that we went to. And just so you'll be aware, our next step is on August 4th and 5th, we have invited about 130 stakeholders, and not just farmers. And where I'm going to focus my comments tonight is why we're not just inviting farmers to think about the vision of agriculture in 2030. This state has 12% of the nation's population, and it is the number one ag state by leaps and bounds, we're three times larger than the next largest state. So think about the clash of having 12% of the nation's population in the most productive ag state in the country, if not one of the most in the world. That clash for natural resources, those changing demographics right at the rural urban interface, that's very much what you do on a daily basis. And that's why we're reaching out to about 130 very diverse stakeholders. Paul, I'm sure glad you're going to be there. Because it's high risk, but it's high gain. When you have authors like Michael Pollan and chefs like Alice Waters, who have more sway with what people think about their food and the food system and where it comes from, there's a potential downside of that. But there's also a tremendous upside to that. Because what we're seeing is that people, and especially the younger generation, are vitally interested in where their food comes from, who's farming it, and what kind of practices you use. It's a huge issue. And the sooner we really work on developing those kinds of multi-stakeholder coalitions, the sooner we'll bring much broader voices to the public policy arena to advocate the policies and the investments that need to be made if we want to assure a robust and healthy agriculture in the year 2030. So 
that's what we're going to be working on. Some examples of why that's so important right now. Um, we had at the Capitol a few short weeks ago the chair of the newly named um, Committee on Food and Agriculture convene a hearing to examine the wisdom of eliminating the Department of Food and Agriculture because all they do is serve farmers and no one else has their own dedicated department. Now what we did because of work that we started four years ago, I was on the steering committee to create the California Roundtable on Agriculture and the Environment, we worked very hard in that group, we wrote a letter to the chair, we sent our facilitator to the hearing, the good senator who chairs that committee is known for listening to testimony and never making eye contact because of his Blackberry. And he already knew the kind of hostile questions he wanted to ask the department and challenge them on. When our person for the California Roundtable of Agriculture and the Environment went up to speak about the importance of the Department of Food and Agriculture far beyond the farms and ranches of the state, he went through the important things that they do that the public benefits from pest exclusion, food safety standards. He went through a whole list of them. And then he proceeded to name the names of all the organizations that signed off on that letter. They were as diverse as the California Farm Bureau Federation, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Nature Conservancy, the Environmental Defense Fund. And that's when the good senator stopped looking at his Blackberry and looked up. Those are the kinds of smart, strategic things that we need to do. And especially as the environmental community recognizes more and more that your stewardship of natural resources is the best and lowest cost way of achieving the environmental standards that we have embodied in law. Very important that we continue doing that. At the federal level right now, I'm sure you read a lot about climate change legislation, which is really called the Energy Security Act, which some of my directors prefer to just shortcut to the energy tax bill. But where did that legislation go? It could have a profound effect on every one of our farming and ranching operations. That bill did not go through the Agriculture Committee. That bill went to, was passed out of, negotiated in the Energy and Commerce Committee. We don't know how to interface with those people very well. I think we're going to learn really fast because major food safety legislation just passed out of that committee two weeks ago. Food safety legislation that traces all the way back to your farm so that within two days, supposedly, the government will know if there's a food safety scare where it came from. These are the kinds of profound changes that are starting to happen as people lose confidence in their food system, primarily because of highly publicized food safety scares. And we have the opportunity to own a word that is important to many, many people right now. And it's something that's very near and dear to the wine grape and wine community, the word sustainability. That's ours. The three-legged stool, farming for the future, thinking about how do I preserve my soil, how do I use water most efficiently, how do I treat my people as an asset so they want to continue working for me, how do I make sure that the next generation and my grandkids and their grandkids are here on this land generations from now? That's sustainability, and every one of you do that, and many of you have done it for how many generations? I met somebody who's an eighth generation farmer a few weeks ago. My brother's only the fourth generation on my farm in western Nebraska. We own sustainability and we should not be afraid of the word. We should be willing to step up and help measure it and communicate it and not be afraid to be transparent about it. 